Swinburne University of Technology. Hello everybody. Topic three. Um, now this is culture and socialization. I know we've done socialization in the last one, um, but this is looking at how, how culture uh, is a part of the, the, social, oh, the socialization process. So much fun. Um, okay, so <clears throat> what's culture? Culture Culture is the dynamic intersection of values and norms. Does that make sense? Probably not. Okay, so culture, culture is the, the context in which we live. And, and when we're talking about values and norms, um, values obviously you have, have a bit of an understanding of, the, that is the, the, the sort of the internal moral, ethical rules that we live our life by. We have personal values and obviously they are much more, they're family value, family on oh, family values. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to get a lot of this before November when the American elections finally happen. Um, and then there are, there, as there's indicated <laughs> by that reference, there are broader sort of uh, social uh, values that are uh, posited in, in, a, in a country, in a, um, I'm going to say in a culture, but I need to explain that better before I start to talk about that, De deposited in the identity um, um, the concept we have about our, our country, say. So we have distinctly what we would describe as Australian values and we could probably all sort of tick a few of those off, even though some of them I think are a bit old-fashioned, like egalitarianism, fair go, she'll be right. Oh. Is that a bit 57-year-old David, do you think? You think young people are going, what's she'll be right? And should I have said it like that? And if I said she'll be right, you go, who is this bloke? And what's he talking about? Anyway, <clears throat> we'll get back to, to those. But you, you get a sense of what I mean by values. Those, those, those rules, if you like, that we live by, that inform us about how to be in the world. Norms are, norms are actual rules, if you like. Norms are practices that we conform to um, habitually because we know... Um, life works better if we conform to, to those habitual rules. Um, and, some, and, and more than that, they, they can be legislated. So norms can also be given expression through, um, um, through the police, where the norm is to drive on the left-hand side of the road. And if we don't drive on the left-hand side of the road, uh, apart from endangering our lives and others, will be fine. So that there are enforceable norms as well in society um, that, that go um, to, to a great extent to the good order of, of society. But you can see also that, that norms also reflect upon values as well. Um, so that... Um, Oh, honor killing, it's the first thing that came to mind. In, in, a, in, in Australian society, it wouldn't be possible, and I suppose in other societies it's not possible either, although it is a practice, that honor killing would occur. Um, the fact that honor killing occurs, and, and just recently actually, um, to cut across the stereotype, there was an honor killing that, that, that occurred in Canada, where um, I think a, a, a mother and a father were convicted of, of killing their daughter. Um, that it couldn't be got away with and that these people are in jail because that the breaking of that, what we consider, consider fundamental norm of the right to life, reflects upon society. So that's, that's sort of a gross example of where a norm, um, an enforceable norm in terms of that mediated by legislation in the legal system enforces uh, sort of values, um, it's reasonably easy to read. The more subtle norms um, uh, are the ones that, that we're more interested in. And if you think about refugees, um, <coughs> excuse me, and, and what's happened in recent years where we've, we've enforced norms like we've excised Ireland. So Australia, 
um, I'll put this down as, as Australia in the, the shape we know it is, is the, the continent, but there have been islands all around, particularly to the north, that were also part of Australia, so that if a refugee landed on that island, they effectively landed on the Australian legal system and were subject to it and had rights um, uh, in terms of, of their ability to access that legal system and have representation um, in it. But we excise, that is, we, we stop those islands being a part of, of a, effectively a part of Australia, so that if a refugee boat arrived on one of those islands, they were no longer subject to our legal system. Um, now, whether you agree with that or not, um, you can see that the exercise of that norm, turning, turning that rule, if you like, on its head and no longer allowing that to be, does reflect to a certain extent our values as well. So norms and values, this is what I mean about this sort of dynamic intersection. They, they feed each other. So you would argue that the values, the collective values of Australians don't seem to be sufficiently strong to stop that happening because the government was able to resist those who did see that as, as something that was, was wrong um, um, and attempted to persuade the government away from those sort of actions um, weren't sufficiently strong or, or sufficient in number to turn that around. So there, there is this, this dynamic interplay and you get, you get a bit of an insight into to the culture of a country through that dynamic interplay and what rules we choose to enforce. The other classic, I suppose, is the white Australia policy um, in terms of, of sort of norms and values and that dynamic interplay. Um, the white Australia policy, the Immigration Restriction Act of 1901, which it was known as, um, essentially was, was posited on the notion that, that white British people were the ideal migrant to Australia and others weren't, or others were relatively, or there was a relativity of, of acceptability in, from other ethnic groups uh, in terms of their worthiness to, to be accepted as immigrants in, in Australia. And part of the process uh, in order to vet these people who were coming in who weren't white and British uh, was to give a dictation test and the dictation test um, which we'll talk, we'll talk about this a bit later in ethnicity or race and racism and ethnicity. Um, the dictation test was administered at uh, the border at the maybe the the dock because there are lots of boats that were coming to Australia um, back in that period between 1901 and 1970. Anyway, during the Whitlam government between 72 and 75, it ended. Um, <clears throat> not quite sure which year it ended in that time. But um, uh, so lots of boats were arriving and there were also planes arriving. So when you got there and, and you weren't white and British and you were, you, were, you were coming here, but it may also have happened when you were applying for immigration overseas, there was a dictation test. And so you'd think, okay, well, fair enough, if you're coming to a, to a country where English is the, the dominant, overwhelmingly dominant, well, the only language at that stage, how indigenous language is you know, put aside for the, for the time being, um, you would imagine that the dictation test might reasonably be in English. Well, no, you'd be wrong. It could have, it could have been in any language of the Commonwealth. So young David turns up here from where? Where have you turned up from? Lebanon. Lebanon. Young David has turned up from Lebanon and he looks, he's sort of white, but he might be a little bit swarthy and he's certainly got black hair. And so we go, we don't know whether he'll fit in. David, let's do a dictation test. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Oh, I can speak English, there's no problem, he's saying to himself. So, if you could translate this into Gaelic, if you wouldn't mind. What, you can't? Oh, David, I'm really sorry. Oh, David, that's such a shame. There's the, the boat just over there. Oh, you've forgotten your bags. Would you take your bags, please? I forget. Bye, David. Um, now, this was a reasonably crude, belligerent and racist piece of legislation that restricted 
good-looking young chaps like David from arriving from Lebanon. But what happened was it was honoured actually, what they say, honoured more in the breach than... Um, um, I'm doing it again in the next one. Um, what's the cliche on it in the breach rather than the observance? Ooh, it was close. Um, and what happened was David turns up and we have a look at him. He seems like a nice guy. G'day, how are you going? And he's affable, friendly, and there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with him. He's got his lovely mother there and they look like a nice family. Now, I'm the immigration official. I have the option of going, we'll give him the Gaelic, no, Gaelic dictation testing, won't they? Yeah. Or not. And in a lot of cases, it was honoured in the breach. That is, it wasn't given because the person at, at the door, if you like, made the arbitrary decision, ah, come on, you'll be right. And this is the fair go, she'll be right. And so, despite the fact that we had this thing, it was, it was really reserved for political people, and particularly for communists back in, in or it was, I'm sorry to say this, <laughs> for Chinese and Asian people because Back then we weren't too happy about them. Um, but then um, contentious political immigrants who were, who were coming from Eastern Europe, um, when the government actually intervened to make sure they got the dictation test and didn't get in. In the sort of everyday transactions, values were able to supplant the norm because of the, the, sort of the arbitrary nature of uh, uh, administering the dictation test. So in a lot of cases it wasn't administered and people were let in. So despite the fact that we had this really strong, oppressive, determinate norm, if you like, in the form of legislation, stopping people coming in, there were these cultural values that bled through and subverted that to a certain extent. So, you know, just to balance up the, <laughs> the example I was giving earlier, we did, we did have these, these sort of value systems that were, were much more equitable uh, being able to leak through. Ultimately, the norm's going to win, uh, but um, that gives you a bit of an idea of how that dynamic works. So, <coughs> what do we got? Okay, so, so culture is expressed through thoughts and things. But these, in, so this is the colloquial, colloquial way of understanding it. What we talk, we're talking about really here is non-material and material culture. So non-material culture are our, our thoughts, our intellectual property, the, the ingenuity we have, um, the way we see ourselves, the way we, we talk about ourselves. And the material culture, the things, are, are the stuff of, of our culture that, that we would identify. I, I was looking up, you'll see something about John Howard. Um, Oh, in the politics thing, I, I imagine. And I was just, you know, scrolling through, through Google. Um, don't you do that for research purposes, only I'm allowed to do that. You're going to the library. Um, but I was, I was, I, there was a p picture of Howard, must have been from his biography. And, and he's just, he's sitting, he's sitting in the study, looking very Howard and conservative and stern, and there's the profile of, of Profile of him. Is that good? <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, but over in the corner behind him, there was a pile of cricket bats. And there must have been 20 or 30 cricket bats in this study, you know, this sort of Chesterfield leather study. Um, like that. But this big pile of cricket bats behind him. Um, material culture, you just had to look at that and you read something about who he is, what his values may be, certainly what his interests are, um, maybe even his social or class position because we all know he wasn't a cricket player because we all saw him, did we all see him try to bowl that <laughs> ball? Yeah, we did, David did. Um, so he can't play cricket, we know that, so he's not got all those bats there because he's such a shit hot batsman. Um, and I'm assuming that it's been signed by blokes um, because he wouldn't have been in this. No, he wouldn't have been into women's cricket. No, no, David doesn't think so either. So material culture, material culture is expressed in, in sort of some of those forms. Um, and I'll talk about that, that a bit more later. But if you get the idea that, that, that culture is both non-material and material, it's how we think and what we use. Um, What's this saying? 
Oh, look, you may not be able to read this too. I better be a bit more careful. Culture makes us. So the idea that our, our culture turns us into who we are is, is how, how you think about culture. There is an Australianness, and um, particularly if you think of, of, of migrants who've come to this, this country, and I think particularly of the Italian and Greek migrants, um, because we've, we've, we've seen them for a long time, and the, uh, the wogs out of work, um, and was it wogs out of work? Was there something before that? Okay, wogs out of work, where you see them being Australian in a woggy way. I mean, the, 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 the nice thing about that was they're playing off of, of, of being Australian in a, in a wog context, and I'm using that term in the way they used it, um, so that the, the, the culture has made them, and, and the meeting of those two cultures was, was the, the interesting thing because um, to a certain extent, um, because the, the Italian and the Greek m migrants of the post-war period have become Australian, I mean there is, there is, there is a distinct Australianness about those Greek and Australian and Greek and, and Italian migrants or Southern European migrants that has become sort of part of being Australian, um, and then when you see the um, what was his name? No, yeah, no, okay. Hey, that'll do. Um, um, oh, anyway, uh, when you see that 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 melding of the cultures and you see their demonstration of their cultural identity. As Australians, through that 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 other other prism, you you get the understanding of how culture makes us, how how an Australianness is fed in through this, this sort of ethnic identity, and then comes out in this this sort of a hybridised way, if you like. So culture is culture is sort of essential to understanding who we are. Now. Culture, I suppose, goes back to prehistory. In uh, sociology, is closely linked to another discipline called anthropology. And anthropology um, um, certainly looks at, at at culture, and probably to a certain extent more 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 concertedly and strongly than than sociology ju does. Anthropology also has this um, this area that it's interested in, which is known as prehistory, which is the sort of Look at the evolutionary process of, of how we evolved to become Homo sapiens, which is the, the species form we, we have now. And the argument is that about two million years ago, um, we could identify the first sort of step away from apes um, in um, um, this form called Australopithecus. It used to be when I was studying it. A long time ago, Australopithecus robustus, but I saw something in the paper the other day and it started with another name. Anyway, this is a monkey thing that um, had those key markers that separated it from the other primate species. And so the evolutionary path started with this thing two million years ago, which was Australopithecus, and moved up through the hominids. Mm -hmm. yeah, through that stage until we got to Homo sapiens, although we had this sort of funny branchy thing maybe with Neanderthals and Homo sapiens around at the same time and being two different species and there was there's argument there was competition between them and we could have actually become all like rugby league footballers or Neanderthals. Um, that was naughty wasn't it? It was, was it? <laughs> Although interestingly, there was there was a, there was a study a few not released not no maybe late last year, middle of last year that that suggested that that we all have. This is back to what I was talking about a couple of weeks ago. DNA from no, in the introduction, DNA from Neanderthals. Not me. Very elegant. Um, <laughs> So anyway, the point is that two million years ago we started to evolve and as we started to evolve out of this, out of the trees if you like, culture was a key component of that and particularly material culture because some of the ways, the main ways we identify uh, through uh, the anthropological and archaeological record, the development of, of humans is 
their material culture, what they've left behind. Um, so the, 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 the rocks they used as, as knives, the middens that you find, um, um, particularly uh, around Australia where, where you have the, the seashells, the remnants of, of meals. Um, um, certainly bones, which give us sort of the, the, the biological history, but, but the material culture is, is important in, in identifying previous civilizations. Um, um, I'm thinking of, of Australian Indigenous people who had civilizations going back 40, 60,000 years and, and part of the way we identified these, these civilizations was through their material culture, things they'd left behind, things that they used to transact their daily lives, which firstly told you that they were there, secondly told, told a story about the nature of those civilizations. So civilization then becomes the other um, <clears throat> key way of understanding what, what culture is like and civilizations leave leave material culture behind um, with you know the, I was talking about the ancient Greek civilizations we've had Mesopotamia all that, that sort of central Asian uh, European area um, again this is a slightly European focus um, all of the civilizations that, that no longer exist have left a material culture behind and that material culture has told us about the nature, to a great extent, the nature of the civilization. Um, so the major, there are um, five, one, two, three, four, yes there are, there are five major components of, of culture. Um, we have symbols um, and and there are, there there are lots of sort of symbolic elements to our culture that tell us about about our culture. Um, I mean, flags obviously are um, a, a, a particularly potent symbol um, and remain so. I'm, I'm I'm still interested that the Australian flag is still a symbol that that's. That's defended so rigorously by by people as as uh, as um, a, a symbol not so much of Australianness but of those who fought and died under it, and it's I've, I've always been surprised at the extent to which people defend our flag, which has another country's flag in its corner, um, and how firmly we, we, we appear to hold on to, to the flag because it's a symbol and it's a symbol of, it's an historical symbol, it's not, probably not a modern, well no it's become a modern symbol hasn't it? Because people wear these things around their neck. So um, um, it's actually, it's, it's, it's actually become a far more potent symbol these days now they reflect upon it than it has for years and part of that I, I may be explained by the, the inherent conservativeness of society at the moment. It may be, um, uh, it may be that national, I think nationalism generally is on the rise and maybe it's a reaction to globalisation. There may be lots of reasons for it but, but those symbols Symbols then are read as cultural iconography. So you, you, you see an Australian flag and we will all read it differently, um, but, um, and it depends on the context in which you read it. So if I'm looking at Australian flags in 2005 on being carried by blokes with blonde hair and board shorts on in Cronulla, um, I've got a particular reading of the Australian flag. For those of you who don't remember, there was there were riots in Cronulla in 2005, where there was a belligerent and I think offensive nationalism being being given expression to, um, uh, using the Australian flag and Australian identity. Um, whereas the Australian flag at a sporting event may have a, a different context. Um, the Australian flag on a backpacker's backpack when they're in another country um, will have a, a I, I suppose an effect of, of drawing you in and drawing you close the the flag when it's used 
um, in Anzac commemorations, we'll, we'll have another, um, another sort of cultural meaning. So um, seeing it on the back of cars, seeing it flying out car windows on Australia Day, has has a meaning <laughs> to some of us. I, I, think my, I must admit, my daughter was telling me that she read she read some research that said that no, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> no, no, okay. Um, so um, symbols symbols are potent, and symbols are redolent of of a culture um, and an understanding. So. Um, the golden arches is the other the other classic. If you you're looking at symbols, you you will see the golden arches in some places four miles off because part of part of capitalism and marketing means that if you get it higher and wider, it it gets seen broader. But but it's we know how to read what those golden arches are because we understand we understand what they stand for, but they stand for something and they stand for different things for different people. To, to some people it's a hamburger shop, to, to kids it's an exciting treat, to jaded old sociologists it's a corruption of food and, and industrial, industrialization of the food process. All those sort of things can be read into symbols. So symbols are important part of understanding culture, but they're not necessarily unifying or unified. Um, language obviously is another thing and language language is incredibly important um, not just for communication and getting your ideas across but as a cultural marker and, and a point of solidarity uh, and one of the, one of the the sad things about Australian history is the the loss of, of indigenous languages and what that means for the identity of the culture. It's not simply that there's there's one less means of communication, there's a whole identity that goes with language as well because we form our language um, to reflect our culture um, and we form, we, we form our language to, to reflect our, our individual identity as well. Uh, language, language is key to, 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 well some will argue that, that without language there is, there is no identity. Um, there's certainly um, from a, um, uh, an, an ethnic point of view, language is important for, for that sense of solidarity and for that, that sense of history and connection with the past and with family um, and, and with a, with a world view. So language obviously is an important constructor. Um, so values and beliefs, um, I've talked about them a lot through, through this lecture. We understand that, that they, they, to a certain extent, determine um, and narrate um, our, our cultural identity um, as strongly as any of the any any of these other things. Um, norms, which I've talked about, the rules which we follow are are particular to all societies, um, uh, but they may vary from society to society. They, all societies won't have the same norms. They won't have the same enforced uh, rules that that determine what sort of country you live in and you can you can think of lots of examples of those. Um, so material culture um, is the final one and, and so um, you, you think about the material culture, you think about walking into somebody's home um, uh, who you've not met before and you immediately look around and look at the stuff they've got, the things they have, the material culture that gives an expression um, in, in a symbolic sense that tells you about how they are in the world and, and maybe what they're like in, in the same way that, that, that the big symbol, the big material culture like, like Holden's or industrial factories or you know large parliament houses all of these things that are material that that tell us about um, something about the the people who who in, inhabit them um, the type of houses we have all of those sort of things um, give us an, an insight into to how culture works now um, there are various cultures, um, high culture, subculture, counterculture, 
Sorry. Now I'm not ready for that yet. I'm gonna have to go back to this one. So, okay. So cultures. Um, oh, look. oh, they're sticky, David. Oh, this works well. Look at that. Fantastic. Okay. So. Um, High culture, subculture, counterculture. Um, cultures um, can be read in a number of different ways and one of the competing things um, that we've dealt with uh, had to do with recent, what well, we've seen develop over the last 20 or so years is the difference between high culture and low culture if you like and um, maybe we'll talk about it briefly a bit later but the idea of uh, I was talking about earlier about modernity and post-modernity, one of the things that, that Postmodern modernity introduced and and uh, bugger. Okay, I'm just going to have to talk briefly about postmodernity because I can't, shouldn't introduce something that that I don't actually explain. So we've had the idea that that science that science out of the Enlightenment um, and the scientific approach to constructing knowledge and the certainty that it gave us um, became known as modernity. Um, in around the 1980s, we had this 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 breakdown or failure. Um, in oh, hang on, oh, I've, I've, I, it's all right. I've just had coffee delivered. <laughs> Coffee's arrived. So sorry, but <clears throat> I gotta get about it. Ah, uh, so 20 years ago, um, when postmodernism started to emerge as a response to some of the failures of modernism, some of the failures of science, um, certainly, well not certainly because they like to dismiss this, but because we saw in the Second World War, because we saw in the 20th century more people killed in the 20th century than in the whole history of Western civilization anyway, um, and it was done scientifically, rationally, the, the Nazis um, used bureaucracy, bureaucratic processes to make killing massive numbers of people, efficient and effective. Um, and because we saw sort of the intersection of capitalism and um, uh, science start to start to pervert slightly the 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 notion of of uh, the rigors and honesty and um, infallibility of science, there became this movement, uh, it was French philosophers um, who developed this notion of postmodernism and essentially po well, postmodernity because postmodernism is an art movement so we need to be distinct between postmodernism and postmodernity. Postmodernity and the idea of postmodernity was there became a sort of uh, a scepticism about having all of the answers through science, having the the other I suppose the other thing was one of the things about modernism was that that it felt like it could capture, have the answers for everybody. So you had large institutions and institutional practices that were overlaid on everybody, like I was talking in, in structures earlier on. So capitalism was a totalizing sort of institutional methodology of distributing income, if you like. Communism was, was a, a, a modernist process that was um, set up to, well, kill lots of people <laughs> initially, but also to provide for a whole population. Religion was the same. It was, it was uh, something that, that had a message for everybody. So post-modernity came along and said, well, no, it, it obviously doesn't work for everybody. Uh, we've seen serious failures in, in scientific method. We've seen the scientific method be bastardized by um, the interests of capitalism. I'll offer you tobacco as one of the, um, um, the major contributors to, to that sort of scepticism. So post-modernity had this idea that um, <clears throat> experts, people like me standing up in front of lots of people telling them about how the world works, should be subject to incredulity, that, that we should be sceptical about people who had the answers for everything. So. Um, and part of that, getting back to what we're talking about in terms of high culture, low culture, was that, that 
um, there was a there was a skepticism about what was high culture and what was low culture. Was a three minute pop song, for example, less worthy than than an operatic aria? Um, so this this notion that there were there were distinctions, distinct separations between high and low culture um, that had values attributed to it, that high culture good, low culture bad. Um, um, who's that? I'm going to go film now and I'm not going to be able to do it. Um, anyway, think of an arty director from Northern Europe, David. Ingmar Bergman. That too? Actress. No, that's Ingrid. Oh, Ingmar, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so arty, arty film as, this, as opposed to, oh, the, oh, um, looks a bit like me, bald. <laughs> I'm bald. No, well, I'm not bald. Why did I say that? Um, Speedlift. No, 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 I'm thinking, you know, that American, oh, Jesus, just bear with me for a minute, I'll, I'll think this through rather than pause it. Um, uh, Bruce, Bruce. Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis, thank you very much. <laughs> that was worth the journey. Uh, <laughs> all right, so Ingmar Bergman and Bruce Willis. Yeah, Ingmar Bergman, good, Bruce Willis, bad. Um, Postmodernism collapsed these, tried to collapse these distinctions. Um, that's a bit of an aside, but I don't, I think it's always bad practice to, to mention something um, uh, cursorily, um, assuming you know it when in fact you haven't been taught it. And it, I'm teaching you stuff, so it's important to make sure that you know what I'm talking about. So in terms of culture, there was, there is, there's the notion that there's high culture, there's low culture. We do value that, whether, whether those, those values are challenged or otherwise, we still understand that there, there are relative values on, on high and low culture. Um, there are subcultures. So the idea of subculture is that, um, I live in the Australian culture. Um, but I also live in a, in, in, and we all do live in subcultures. We have, um, I have a particularly close friend who um, is engaged with the steampunk community. Um, that's a subculture. She's a member of my broader family culture. She's a member of Australian culture. She's a member of all sorts of different cultures. And so, so and, and we can identify one of those as, as steampunk. Steampunk is just sort of a way of dressing up and being different. Um, that's a subculture, but it doesn't exclude you from the other surrounding overarching culture, if you like. Countercultures are, are somewhat different. Countercultures are trying to set up in opposition to the main culture and the, the, sort of, and the big countercultural movement, obviously, was the, the 60s with the hippies and all of that love stuff, um, where part of the intention was uh, to, to set up a competing model and demonstrating that that model um, works effectively and can challenge the, the over, overarching culture. So now I can do it. Not as effectively. This doesn't work as well, David. We won't do this in future, will we? Okay, so um, the other two two categories, ethnocentricity and cultural relativity, and hegemony are, are quite important as well. Ooh, ethnocentricity. Okay, the when I've been talking about because uh, I've talked a number of times. I hope you've been watching from the beginning. Um, I've been talking a number of times about the particular European view that, that we're, we're taking with, with sociology. That's uh, another way of describing that is an ethnocentric view. Um, uh, eth the ethno bit being your ethnic identity, your, your, sort of, you know, your um, background in terms of where you where you grew up, what country you came from, what your practice, the religious practices, your your broader sort of cultural practices, your food, your language practices, all contribute to your ethnicity. Um, 
and the, the notion of the centrism is that you see things from that particular perspective. So ethnocentrism centrism is, is seeing the world from your particular country's point of view, if you like. So we'll, when, when, when we're looking at, well, when we're looking at immigrants who come to Australia, um, particularly from a, a, a critical, negative critical, not critical that we've been talking about earlier, um, but from a, a, a perspective that, that, that invites you to, to make criticisms about the way they live and the way they are, they being in inverted commas, um, you've got to stop and remind yourself that you're seeing this through the lens of your ethnic, cultural, uh, national background and that's ethnocentrism so if we see the world from our own our own point of view and we make our point of view the correct point of view and the other point of view the wrong way of being um, that's generally ethnocentrism is generally um, the idea that, that you're interpreting um, other people's actions by your ethnic country standards not by their own um, so you're not seeing things in the context that they're happening. They're seeing them. For, you're seeing them from the context of of your background and your your um, nationalistic. Usually, it is nationalistic point of view. Um, so that that creates a divide, a cultural divide, uh, and the uh, the classic us and them or other, which is the anthropological term we use for um, culture separate from from our own. Um, that obviously causes difficulties. Uh, there is an answer to that, and that's cultural relativity, coming to understand that, that different cultures have different ways of giving, giving expression to their values and their norms, and we need to, and it's, it also harks back to the sociological imagination, to unpack what's happening and try and understand it um, in a cultural, cultural relative culturally relative way rather than from an ethnocentric point of view. Um, the, other, the other notion um, that, that we need to deal with is hegemony or hegemony, um, depending on what school you went to I suppose. Um, anyway, hegemony, hegemony, H-E-G-E-M-O-N-Y, developed by an Italian bloke um, called Antonio Gramsci. Um, around the time of the Second World War uh, when he was in jail um, for being nasty to Mussolini. Um, Mussolini was Hitler's mate during the Second World War. Um, hegemony is the idea and, and, and it's, it's a wonderful piece of theorising because it's, it's still relevant today. Hegemony is the idea that the powerful group is able to convince the group out of power that the group out of power should believe in those things that are in the interests of the powerful group despite the fact that it's to the detriment of the, the group that doesn't hold power. Is that too complicated, Dan? Mm, maybe a bit. No, not really. Okay, so you get people to believe in what you want them to believe in because it's in your interests. But the way you get them to do that is for them to believe it's in their interests. Now, um, throughout Australia there are tabloid newspapers and tabloid newspapers generally are classic hegemonic um, um, documents. Um, and capitalism is the, the cl classic form of hegemony that the working class, and I'm, I'm thinking of the tabloid papers, that the working class and the tabloid papers are vehement supporters of, of the status quo of capitalism, which is really not in their interests. It gives them a wage and it makes things comfortable and the, the world works reasonably effectively, but it's certainly not in their interests, or disproportionately it's in the interests of, of those people in power. The other classic example of hegemony, and see, okay, the idea of hegemony is it tells you about the culture of the circumstance you find yourself in, because hegemony can happen in a family as well, and generally it's the parents getting the kids to believe that, that doing stuff the way the parents want to be is in their interests. Well, it may or may not be, if you want to go to the playground, and they don't. Um, but I think the classic case recently, and it's a beauty, 
is the, the mining tax and what they called originally, in its original form, the super profits tax, that a government proposes to tax businesses, 83% of which are owned overseas, not by Australians, who are here digging up our stuff, sending it overseas and making windfall profits at, at the moment, massive profits, enormous profits, and that when a government comes along and says, okay, we have special circumstances here. You guys are making an enormous amount of money from digging up our minerals and sending them overseas. Now, this is a finite resource. Once they're dug up and gone, they're gone. They're not renewable. They're not going to come back again. They're gone. So, we have a boom. We have mining companies making enormous amounts of money. Government comes along and says, OK, you can make that much money, but above that, we're going to ask you to pay a bit of extra tax. And it was 40%. It wasn't 40% on everything. It was 40% above a particular level. Now, I'm reasonably well paid, but I'm not enormously well paid. I pay nearly 40% tax on the last part of my income. I'm already paying that. So the government suggests this. And suddenly all hell like breaks loose. <laughs> all hell breaks loose and the government's doing this dreadful thing to these organisations. Now, we're given to believe that, that actually the polling data said Australians didn't mind this, but the media, the outrage and talkback radio, the commentary was how dare, how can the government do this? What do they think they're doing? Now that we're saying no, we don't want money from these mining companies who are taking it, 83% of it, overseas. Don't give us that money. You leave because they deserve it. They're digging up our stuff and selling it and making enormous amounts of money. Great, you let them have it and they can have as much as they like. We don't want the money, no thank you. This is hegemony. This is us believing that something <laughs> that is in the, the good of others is actually going to be good for us. Well, it's not. It's simply not. And, you know, we saw enormous profits coming out and they were even prepared to come back and renegotiate it. They, uh, so, and, you know, there was a report today on the, the, the paper, the, the fly in, fly out mining, because they're saying, well, you know, mining's good and if, if we don't have mining, then all these communities are going to fall apart. Well, one of the problems we have is communities in, in the Bowen Basin in Queensland are having their population replicated with people flying in. So there may be 20,000 people living in, in one of these towns. 20,000 people fly in. Suddenly they've got to support an additional 20,000 people who aren't paying rates to the local council, but the local council has to provide another town's worth of support and infrastructure to these people. Rents are $2,600 odd a week, so people are moving out. The dentists left this town. The doctor's thinking about leaving because I think the Australian average for a doctor is one doctor to 1,200 people. In these places, there's one doctor to 2,600 people. Um, this is an enormous impost on our society and community, yet we're going, don't take the money off them. Let them go, let them have the money. So, and this is, this is intrinsically associated with capitalism and, you know, capitalism is aspirational. We've got the, we, we have this cultural understanding about, about rising up through society and becoming wealthy and becoming rich and, and there's this, this, there's this obvious notion that says if we, if we stifle one part, maybe there's some voodoo that's going to work on us and stop, stopping us being wealthy as well. So hegemony is, in, and you look, look for hegemony um, in lots of different places, but I think that's a classic when, when, when the, the little people's newspapers, in particular the tabloids, uh, saying, no, we can't do this. Stop, stop trying to take money off these rich people and give it to the rest of the country. Let them take it away. That's, that's hegemony. Now, this is not to say, this is not some mad sort of socialist um, plot to undermine the mining companies, um, but 
what it is, is identifying by starting to unpack these, these sort of notions and having these tools, because if you start to think of things in hegemonic terms, it's a tool in order to understand how, how society works. If you have that way of thinking and you have that means at your disposal, you will see things in slightly different ways. And they, it may cause you to want things to change, it may not. But having more tools in order to understand the way things work is the important thing, hopefully, that this is giving to you. So, that's culture. This has been a Swinburne production.